Well, good morning, Reliance Church. It is great to be here with you. Welcome. Um, if you are watching online from home, welcome. It's good to have you with us. And if you're in our overflow rooms or outside, it is great to be here with you, all gathered together from wherever we are. Uh, things are a little bit different behind me, so hey, Merry Christmas. We are, uh, we're celebrating uh, the weeks uh, ahead, so it's, uh, it's great to think of the birth of our Savior, and we're going to sing about that a little bit uh, this morning as well. Just a couple of uh, reminders. We have those red bracelets out in the Connect kiosk. For those of you that are here on campus, uh, if you want to slip one of those on, you're welcome to, and just kind of uh, be aware if you see someone wearing a red bracelet, uh, just kind of keep uh, that, uh, that distance. Uh, maybe don't go in for the hug or the handshake, and we want to be sensitive to that. Um, this is a family-style service. Our children's ministry is open, but if you got kids in here, we have activity bags uh, being passed out by the ushers out in the lobby. You can grab one of those, and of course, don't worry about uh, being loud or distraction. Uh, we're all one big family here. We have coffee out in the in the courtyard. You're welcome to bring that in here in the sanctuary as well, and uh, so it's just going to be a great morning. Well, uh, this Sunday, today is the second Sunday of Advent, and so I wanted to read from Luke uh, chapter 1, this is the, the song of uh, Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, as he was born. Uh, he prophesies uh, and says this, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. Amen. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. He has brought salvation to his people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God with which the day spring from on high has visited us to give light to those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Praise the Lord, we need this. Heavenly Father, we bless you because you have visited and redeemed your people. Lord, we are so grateful, and so we want to praise you. We want to worship you, Lord, because you are good, because you perform your mercy upon us. You take away our sins through the advent of Jesus Christ, through his death and his resurrection, Lord, you have offered salvation to us and we praise you. And so, Lord, even now, though we sit in, in a, a world broken by sin and darkness and tears and grief, Lord, you are the light that shines in the morning. Lord, that sends away the darkness and the shadow of death and you guide our feet into the way of peace. So, Lord, we worship you. Help us to take hold of that promise, Lord. We want to feel you. We want to experience you. We want to know you more and more this morning. Guide our feet into the way of peace. Jesus, we love you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. I am Scott. I'm one of the worship leaders here. Why don't we stand together? We're going to worship the Lord this morning. We're going to sing some Christmas songs, which is always exciting. Uh, and it's also like 5,000 chords and even more words. So we're, we're going to do our best up here to do, to do these right. Let's sing together this morning. Hark the hair. Peace, hail the Son of Righteousness, light and 
Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my 
masso, oh, oh, oh masso, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh, oh masso, I worship Your holy name. Your rich in love. And you're slow to anger Your name is great And your heart is kind For all your goodness I will keep on singing Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find Oh, to find Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, and worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. And on that day, when my strength is failing your heart is free and the time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forever more see that's bless the lord Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. We sing it out, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. before church see you were the word you were the word at the beginning one with God and Lord most high your hidden glory in creation now reveal Girl. 
that name to worship you lord in spirit and in truth lord as we dive into your word we pray that you would give us understanding into uh, lord not only what it says but what it means and what it means for our, our lives lord as we walk out these doors may we be more like you not less uh, may we reflect your image to our surrounding our neighbors and our community and may we be a light in this very dark world lord we love you and we lift this all up in your name and all god's people said Amen. Why don't you guys say hi to one another? You can do a social distance hi, a wave, a hello. And if you're online, I love saying this, grab your phone and uh, text someone. If you want to uh, just, you know, uh, reach out to someone, maybe send them an encouraging text. I did this last time I led, and I got about 14 texts in my pocket while I was leading worship. So I'm fully expecting that again. <laughs> and uh, we're going we're gonna to continue in worship in our giving. And there's three ways to give here at Reliance. You can give uh, in person. We've got uh, boxes in the back. Uh, you can text uh, any dollar amount to 84321. And you can give online at reliancechurch.org slash gift. Uh, Reliance, let me say that again. Reliancechurch.org slash give. <laughs> and uh, you can also uh, mail your gift to the church office. So um, we're going to get back into worship here. Uh, and, and giving, we do this now because giving is part of our worship. We're called to give all that we are to the Lord, including our finances. And so um, I'm going to pray for that now if you join with me. Lord, we, we do come before you again. Lord, your word says we're two or more gathered in your name. You are there in their midst. And so, Lord, we welcome you here this morning. We're thankful that we get to come here and worship you. And, Lord, we can do that freely. Lord, we are blessed uh, in, in a time where it seems like uh, that freedom is, is maybe being taken away sometimes. And um, Lord, right now, we just thank you that we do have the ability to do that. And we recognize so many times in history where believers did not have the freedom to do that. Lord, I pray that as we worship you now, Lord, we'd worship you with all that we are. 
like I said, including our finances, Lord, that we would give it all to you, Lord. It's, it's yours anyways, and we need to be using it according to how you've called us, Lord. And, and uh, I pray for um, the, the offering that's, that's being taken right now, Lord, the, the tithe. And I pray for our leaders that are making those decisions um, to, to use that money, Lord. May they make those decisions wisely. May it be um, spirit-filled and, and led by you, Jesus. Um, Lord, I pray that, uh, that every dollar that is spent is, is prayed over. And um, Lord, I'm thankful that we are at a church where I know that it is. Um, so I just pray for our leaders, Lord, give them wisdom, um, especially in um, a season like this, which is so difficult to navigate for everyone, Lord. We just pray for, um, for our, our pastors here, Jesus. We love you and lift up in your name. Amen. He's worthy. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Sing his name. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one that could ever say, He is worthy. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. He's holy.
make our lives your home. We thank you that you are God with us in this place. We also thank you for your spirit, Lord, who indwells within us as your people, and that you are here in this place too. God, that your presence is so prevalent here. So God, as we worship you and continue to open up your word and to hear from you, God, would you reveal yourself to us, Lord? Speak to us by your spirit and through your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. And here's Pastor Tyler with the announcements. Hey church, here are the announcements for this week. First up, we're really excited to announce our Christmas Eve services coming up this year. The theme is taken from Luke chapter 2, verse 14, where the angels proclaim glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. And so we're just going to meditate on that line, peace, goodwill towards men. Pastor Ted will be bringing the message, preaching the gospel. So this is a great opportunity uh, to bring an unsaved friend or family member. It's an awesome time just to gather uh, together, celebrate Christmas, and uh, just look forward uh, to that peace and goodwill towards men that we have from our Lord and Savior coming down, Emmanuel, God with us. So obviously Thursday, December 24th, we're going to have two services this year, 3 p.m. and 5 p.m. to accommodate all those schedules. And we are offering children's ministry from nursery up to five years old. And so uh, to get your kids uh, in children's ministry signed up um, ahead of time, we ask that you would RSVP, go to Reliance sciencechurch.org slash RSVP Christmas and uh, to get them signed up uh, ahead of time into their classrooms. Again, nursery up to five years old and that link is open uh, starting today. So uh, for the next couple of weeks up until Christmas Eve, uh, you can get them signed up. Otherwise, it'll be a family style service. Uh, so bring the rest of the family, um, all the kids out and uh, it's just going to be a great time here at Reliance Church. For more information or to send a link out to your friends or family members, go to reliancechurch.org slash Christmas 2020 um, and everything will be there. We're so excited. We can't wait uh, to celebrate this year with you all. Hey, our Christmas food drive is in full swing. We're partnering with the Community Mission of Hope uh, right here in the Temecula Valley to provide food for those families in need this holiday season. And so uh, how it works, stop by the Connect kiosk, uh, grab a shopping list, a um, bunch of uh, suggested food items on there, go out and purchase it, and then bring everything back here to the church by December 15th. You can stop by the church office throughout the week or here on Sunday morning, and uh, we'll take those from you. And then uh, the Community Mission of Hope uh, will take it from there and distribute those uh, food items to the families in need. And so this is an awesome way uh, for us to just be the hands and feet of Jesus and show the love and generosity of Christ this holiday season. And if you're watching online or from home and still would like to participate, uh, you can grab that shopping list on our website, go to reliancechurch.org slash food drive and uh, take care of it from there. Hey, mark your calendar. First Tuesday is coming up this Tuesday, December 8th, 7 p.m. Uh, we love doing these, look forward to them uh, once a month where we just gather as a church family um, and uh, just for a night of prayer, worship, waiting on the Lord. It's a great time uh, to fellowship together and just uh, come before the Lord in prayer. Uh, we know that's needed. Um, it's such a sweet time as a church body. So again, uh, this Tuesday, December 8th, 7 p.m. right here uh, at Reliance Church. You guys are all invited. Hey, for you ladies, our women's ministry is putting on the Christmas dessert this year. Um, it's coming up this Friday, December 11th, 6.30 p.m. Make sure to get signed up. The theme this year is joyful and triumphant, and it's just going to be a celebration uh, of our Lord and Savior uh, this Christmas season. So we've got guest speaker Janie Alfred with us, a special guest worship from Mary Ives. It's going to be a great time. Obviously, delicious dessert will be provided. Uh, some awesome coffee, specialty coffee uh, from uh, Tribe and Trail uh, or Coffee vendors and so it's just going to be a great time again this friday december 11th 6 30 p.m the cost is only 12 dollars per person so to get signed up to get your ticket go to reliancechurch.org slash dessert and uh, ladies make sure to invite a friend as well it's going to be a great night our children's ministry is open of course so next week uh, december 13th make sure to rsvp your kids ahead of time go to reliancechurch.org slash rsvp again from nursery all the way up to fifth grade our connect form 
platform that link's being shown on the screen if you have any questions for us want to get plugged in uh, want to serve somewhere we'd love to chat with you get you connected here at reliance church fill that out we'll be in contact with you this week and of course our prayer request form again that link being shown on the screen uh, we'd love to pray for you pray with you if you have any prayer requests fill that out and uh, we'll be praying for those uh, and with you throughout the week this week and of course if you need to speak with a pastor right now uh, that phone number that's being shown on the screen you can call or text and uh, we'd love to pray for you talk with you encourage you in any way that we can well hey with that uh, grab your bibles and we'll study god's word together all right how you doing reliant church you guys good it's good to have you here i'm blessed to be with you i'm pastor ted i'm one of the pastors here and uh just want to let you guys know um Come hell or high water, we're going to be here and I'm going to be preaching the gospel. So just know that. So uh, we, are, we are thankful to the Lord that he has provided for us to be able to have um, you know, our services available online. And, uh, and man, our multimedia uh, crew is just doing such a great job there. So uh, grateful uh, for them and for the Lord's provision. So uh, we recognize, you know... B- more than than half of our church is uh, is attending and uh, has been attending online, and we're grateful that we can uh, minister to you, that you can join us, that you can be part of the community there uh, online, and we're grateful as well for those of you that uh, are here in person, and um, and we're going to just continue. The service will be available online going forward in in perpetuity before uh, and until the Lord returns, and uh, as long as He has us here, and we'll be here live and in person in various uh, forms. So um, just all those different ways that we have, you know, mask only venues, outside venues, here inside venues, and um, just ask you guys, please, just continue to pray for our staff. Pray for me. Um, I need wisdom. Uh, We've never been through anything like this. We're just doing our best. Want to care for you guys, and uh, and so we're we're doing our best. Appreciate your grace and your mercy and all of that. We're in John chapter eight. If you want to open your Bibles, there we're going to continue today uh, today in the Gospel of John, and. um, uh, I'm probably going to mess up my introduction here, but uh, as we were worshiping, um, I, I just had you know, the, the whole message uh, today centers around Jesus as the light of the world. And, um, and as we were worshiping, I was remembering a season in my life when I was walking in darkness. And it is, it is perfectly illustrated uh, by a story I've told before, and several of you may have heard me tell this story, but, and I'll just keep it brief. But I, I remember a season in my life when I was not walking with the Lord and uh, pretty much living uh, in a bottle um, and uh, was uh, just uh, in, in a very dark season of my life. And, uh, and one night I was out, I was with a bunch of buddies, we were up in Kennedy Meadows, which is in the high Sierras, we were camping, uh, I was uh, very intoxicated, I, I blacked out, I drank so much, and, uh, and I remember coming to, um, and I was outside in the wilderness, it was pitch black and freezing, and, uh, and, I, was, and I was in my chonies and that was it. And, um, and I figured out that, uh, that I had gotten up or went out, you know, from my tent in a very intoxicated state, uh, wandered away from my tent, probably to relieve myself, me and King Saul, right? We're just out there, you know, in the darkness. And, um, um, and I woke up and came to and realized that I was in a world of hurt, that I was in pitch blackness, uh, naked, uh, and very much in trouble. Um, and I had anywhere on the compass that I could have headed to, and my, my tent was, the safety and warmth of my tent was in, a, I didn't know which direction. And I cried out to the Lord at that moment. I just said, help God, and by God's grace, clearly I lived to tell the tale. But that darkness is what I want to talk about today. Not, and, and not the darkness, but I want to talk about the light. The light that leads us in the darkness. Um, you know, uh, the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 17, he's, he's, uh, he's at Mars Hill. He, he's there in Athens. And, um, <clears throat> and he's, he's 
standing up to preach to these people who are so lost. They have, they have idols set up to, to every, you know, deity, every God, little G God you can think of. And, um, and he says to them, I want to talk to you about this unknown God. You have this, this idol set up to worship the unknown God, and I want to preach to you about the unknown God. And um, he, he talks about how um, God gives life and breath to everything and that God satisfies every need. And he says, from one man, he created all the nations throughout the whole earth and decided beforehand when they should rise, when they should fall, and he determined their boundaries. And his purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him though he is not far from any one of us. What Paul's talking about here is how people are groping in the darkness. And I want to talk to you about the light that God has provided in the darkness. So we left off with Jesus teaching in the temple. We're here in John chapter 8. The religious leaders are interrupting his teaching. They drag this woman in, caught in adultery, and really they're using this woman um, as bait. They're using the law as a trap, and they want to catch Jesus. Um, And um, what we saw really was a a twofold lesson last week, that God forgives sin and that God transforms sinners. No matter who you are, no matter what you have done, God loves you. And God, if you will trust in him, promises that he will transform your life. And that was the message that we focused on last week. We're going to continue now in verse 12. And Jesus now having been interrupted, remember he went up to the temple to preach and they interrupted everything. Having been interrupted and having dealt with that interruption, now Jesus goes back to the message that he intended to give. And verse 12 says, then Jesus spoke to them again. After this rude interruption, after dealing with this woman caught in adultery, then Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Now, keep in mind, and this is so important, that all of this is happening against the backdrop of the feast of tabernacles. This is the whole reason and occasion that Jesus has left the Galilee region to come up to Jerusalem to participate in the Feast of Tabernacles. And this Feast of Tabernacles, also known as the Feast of Booths, was a festival that was that was intended to commemorate God's faithfulness to Israel as they were wandering through the wilderness, being set free from their bondage in Egypt, a picture of our bondage to sin. And how through their desert wandering, God was faithful to provide for them. This is the backdrop of Jesus' teaching here today. And understand an important element of the festival. Right here, the festival is ended. Um, But this festival, just thinking back into the backdrop of this festival... Was, was that they would, would do various things as symbolism of God's faithful provision. I told you last week how they would, the priests every day of the festival, they would go and draw water and they would pour the water out in the temple courts to, to, to commemorate God's faithfulness in providing for them and, and nourishing them uh, with water in their wa- wanderings in the wilderness. Well, another thing that they did on every single day of this festival was that there's, there was this huge candelabra that was there in the temple. And, and so they would light this cam, candelabra every single night, and it was serving to commemorate how God guided the people in the wilderness. In Exodus chapter 13, verse 21, I'll throw on the screen for you, it says that the Lord went ahead of them in the wilderness wanderings. Um, he guided them during the day with a pillar of cloud, And he provided light at night with a pillar of fire. And this allowed them to travel by day or by night. And so that that pillar of cloud, it would basically shield them from the intense sun. And so they would just simply walk in the shade. Walk in God's shade as God shielded them uh, from the intensity of the, of the, of the sun's uh, uh, you know, heat. And then the pillar of fire by night would go before them and they would walk in the light, 
right, as God provided uh, for them to be able to walk. And so this was the, the backdrop. This, is, this would happen every single night um, during this festival. But as Jesus here, as he begins preaching in chapter 12, the Feast of Tabernacles has ended. Right? Everyone, verse uh, 53 of of chapter 7, concludes the chapter saying everyone went back to his own house. The the Feast of Tabernacles is now over. And so now this giant candelabra is dark. Right? And Jesus uses this occasion to emphasize the spiritual truth that mankind is in darkness. Mankind is in darkness. Now, I hardly need to illustrate this point, and my intention today is to focus on the light, not on the darkness, but we have to acknowledge that we do live in intense darkness, do we not? It surrounds us, right? And and I will give you one example. We could spend all day talking about the darkness in our society. As I said, I want to focus on talking about the light But I will give you one example about the darkness that we live in. In the Old Testament, we read about how God had called the nation to go into the promised land and that as they were going into the promised land, that there were enemies that they were were continually combating. One of the enemies that they faced were the Canaanites. And the Canaanites were a wicked people. They worshipped the god Molech. And the god of Molech was the god of sex. And the way that they worshipped Molech was that they had a giant bronze statue with two outstretched hands, and they would uh, light a fire and, and on, and they would heat this statue, this bronze statue, up until it was burning red hot, and they would then sacrifice babies on this statue to the god of sex right? And we say, oh man, that is, that's barbaric. That's horrible. It is. And this is why God told the the Israelites in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 21, that you shall not give any of your children to offer them to Molech and so profane the name of your God. He says, don't do this. This, this is an abomination. Well, worldwide today, there is an intense worship of the God of Molech. 56 million babies every year are offered to the God of sex in this abominable way. In the United States, that translates to over 1,700 a day. Statistically speaking, that means that since our service started today... Statistically, 40 babies have been offered to Molech here in the United States. And this is done legally, and we call this choice. This is, this is choice. The world screams for choice. It marches for choice. It votes for choice. And if you have the audacity to speak out against this, you are shouted down as an oppressor of women's rights. Now, people go, well, hold on, wait a minute. What about those instances when abortion is done for the sake of the health of the mother? I will quote Dr. C. Everett Koop, who was the Surgeon General, and he said this, quote, abortion as a necessity to save the life of the mother is so rare as to be non-existent. Now, let's say this, even if 1% of the abortions worldwide were were done to save the life of the mother. They're not, but let's just say 1% of all the abortions were done for this purpose. That still leaves over 55 million babies that have been offered to Molech for convenience, and the world calls it choice. Now, that's just one example of the darkness that we live in. Like I said, we could literally spend all day affirming that we live in a dark world. Isaiah the prophet said this, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And this is the world that we live in. It's a world that celebrates the shameful. It is a world that has parades for things that it should be having funerals for. 
And it is a world that laughs when it should be mourning. And here's the absolute heartbreaking thing about all of this. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 2.26 that the lost world does this because they've been taken captive by Satan to do his will. The Bible calls this the sinful nature. Uh, Paul, outlining the sinful nature to the Galatians, he said this. He says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul says there in Galatians chapter 5 that the sinful nature manifests itself in four basic ways. What he says is that it manifests itself, your sinful nature manifests its will, its will sexually, socially, spiritually, and through the abuse of substances. And every way that the sinful nature, and I want you to get this point, every way that the sinful nature is manifested is based on lies based on lies. And the roots of those lies go all the way back to Satan in the garden. Listen to God's word in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. It tells us there that the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. And one day he asked the woman, did God really say that you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. Satan's reply, you won't die, the certain replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. Now, in case you missed it, here is the lie that every other lie stems from, that you can be God, that you can be God. And it all centers on one word. Here's the word, sovereignty, sovereignty, right? Sovereign, being sovereign. The dictionary defines sovereignty as supreme power and authority. And when you live your life according to the lie that you are the supreme power, that you are the supreme authority, rather than submitting to God who is the only one who has supreme power and supreme authority. And so if you live your life saying, I'm not going to submit, I'm not going to surrender to his supreme power and authority, to his sovereign authority, but rather I'm going to live sovereignly that I'm going to live in a way that I have the supreme power, that I am the supreme authority. If you live that way, then inevitably you will walk not according to God's spirit, but you will walk according to the spirit of the age, which is to walk in darkness. And this is where sex and society and substances exist only to serve you in your sovereign will, right? <clears throat> You'll recall back in John chapter 3, it tells us there that this is the judgment, that light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their lusts were evil. They were living sovereignly saying, I'm the supreme power, I'm the supreme authority. It's been said that sin is pleasurable for a season, but that the season is always too short and the cost is always too high. And the great irony in all of this is that you think you're sovereign when you're doing that, but in reality, you are in bondage to sin. And so Jesus steps into this dark world and he proclaims here in verse 12, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of of life. That phrase there in verse 12, walk in darkness, it's the Greek word peripateo. 
And it means literally to make progress, to make due use of opportunities. Let me illustrate this. Last week or last month, I went into our guest room. Um, and actually, as I do the math, it was probably more than a month ago. Um, but, uh, but I went into the, to the guest room. Now, when I went into the room, uh, one of the kids had been over. We have our guest room is set up, and, and there's, there, you know, it's a guest room. There's a bed and stuff, but there's also toys in there for all the grandkids when they come over that, that they can play. And so the, the grandkids had been over that day. And, uh, and the, 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 their, the guest room reflected that they had been there, right? And so when I walked into the room, they, the light was on. They had left one of the lights on. Well, this is not a light that you can control by the switch on the wall. You have to go into the room. So when I went into the room, <clears throat> and mind you, there's evidence of, of you know, grandkids all over the, the, the room. Um, I was able to navigate through that room to get to the switch on the lamp. Why? because the light was on. Now, it's only, <clears throat> what is it, you know, 12 feet to the, to the, what's a guest room, 12 by 12, something like that. It's only 12 feet, right? So I turned the light off. Well, my house has this unique thing in that particular room where the door won't stay open. You know, you walk in and, you know, it just automatically wants to close, you know? So uh, <clears throat> between my going in from the hall to the back thing, the door had shut. So I flipped off the light, and now I'm in darkness. And so I turn around to walk this 12 feet that I just walked through, no problem, in the light. But now that I was walking in darkness, uh, it's two steps, and you know, there's these, these stupid dumbbells that are in this room. And they had left these all over the floor. Well, I hit that thing. It was like stepping on a wheel, man. It was a wheel. It was just like, brrr, you know, away it went. And I'm up in the air, you know, pot over kettle. I mean, just wham, landing. And, and I hurt myself really bad. I'm like, you know, Brenda hears me from the other room, knocked the wind out of me the whole bit. What happened? <clears throat> PT is an idiot, right? <laughs> See, Without the light, with the light, I could see these stupid things on the floor. Without the light, I walked right into them when I was walking in the darkness, right? <clears throat> this is what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, look, I'm the light, right? And, and he, he, the light is given so that we don't walk in darkness. I'm reminded of King David in 2 Samuel. We recall in 2 Samuel chapter 11, right? Right? Uh, it, it reads this way. I'll just read the text for you. Verses 1 and 2 of 2 Samuel 11. It says, It happened in the spring of the year, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, right? But David remained in Jerusalem. And then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed. He walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful to behold. Here's the issue. David, it tells us where he should have been. It sh he should have been fighting the fight, right? He should have been in the battle, in God's battle, right? As the king of Israel, he is supposed to be there leading this charge leading this battle. David didn't do that. He stayed home. He, he uh, was out of the fight. And so verse 2 then says, it happens that he arose from the, the, his bed and he walked on the king's roof. Now, here's the thing. That, that word, when it, when it says in verse 2 that he walked on the roof, that, that word isn't the, a word that reflects walking with aim and purpose. It's a word that reflects meandering. That he just, why? Because he was not in the center of God's will. He wasn't where he was supposed to be and he wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing. And so now out of the fight, removed from the fight, now he's just sort of meandering and what happens is that there is an opportunity for the exercise of the flesh. He looks down and here's some hot chick and she's bathing and he's like, wow, she's hot. Now, if he'd have been in the spirit, he would have heard the Lord's voice saying, yeah, so is hell, you know, be careful. 
But as the story goes, he's not where he's supposed to be, not doing what he's supposed to be doing. He's walking without aim and purpose. And now he sees an opportunity to exercise the flesh in a sinful way. And of course, he does it. This is how the story goes. That not only does he commit adultery with this woman, but ultimately he will kill her husband to try to cover up his sin. What happened? He left the lighted path. He walked in darkness. And he made due use of an opportunity for the sins of the flesh. Now, in contrast to walking in darkness, making due use of the opportunities that we have, Jesus says, he who follows me shall not walk in darkness. That word follows means to walk in the same direction. And how differently would 2 Samuel chapter 11 read if David had followed the Lord and been where he was supposed to be? Here's the application for us. How's your walk? How is your walk today? Are you making the due uses of opportunities to walk in the light or are you making due use of the opportunity to walk in the flesh? Paul told the Galatians and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. And so that's our exhortation today as believers to stay the course and to walk the walk. But I want you to take note right now, Jesus' call in our text is a call to non-believers. To those who living in the darkness is Tuesday, right? He's calling non-believers and his call as we're going to see as we continue through the text here, is to the most at-risk non-believers that you can possibly be. And this is being a religious non-believer. Being a religious non-believer. Understand, guys, that walking with Jesus is more than just praying a prayer and, you know, hey, I said the prayer, right? It's more than that right? It's more than following some sort of a religious dogma because all religion at its base element is a works-based kind of philosophy. It's a do good, try harder, earn a right standing with God kind of mindset. All religion is, 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 is based on this, right? True religion is really not religion at all. It's a relationship with living, loving God. This is the idea. It's based on a daily walk with Jesus and a daily surrender to his will. Just a closer walk with thee. Grant me Jesus is my plea. It's an old hymn. And this is the attitude, this is the idea of Christianity, that, that what we invite you to is not a religion, it's not to a dogma, it's to a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ who promises to love you, to forgive you, and promises to transform your life as we looked at last week. This is the attitude, this is the idea. And I emphasize this because as we continue, Jesus is about to have a collision with these so-called religious leaders. Notice verse 13. The Pharisees, therefore, says to him, he says, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And the Pharisees, therefore, said to him, you bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. The religious leaders here, they're referring to a command that was given in Deuteronomy chapter 19. And here's the command. It says, one witness shall not rise against a man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he commits. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. This is right. This is reasonable. There should, you know, it's like there should be corroborating witnesses, right? This is the, the idea. Here's what you need to understand. These religious leaders, they think they've got it all worked out, right? Because these guys, they go, hey, we know the Bible backwards and forwards. We've memorized it. And, and so what they've bought into is religion. And so they're bent on keeping the law. But their problem is they know God's word, but they don't know God. 
They know God's word, but they don't know God. See, speaking to the Galatians, Paul said that the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith, right? And the idea is that God gave us his law to point us to our need for a savior. He did not give his law and his standard for one second thinking that you could keep it. Right? And the thing is, is that you have to be perfect. Right? Jesus told his disciples, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you'll by no way inherit the kingdom of God. Unless your righteousness exceeds the most religious people in the world who, who have not only God's laws, but they put literally hundreds of their own laws all around God's law so that they would, you know, judiciously, meticulously keep God's law to the point of, hey, we're going to tithe to God, and so we're going to take all of our spices and we're going to count them out one by one so that we can give God 10% of this. This is so meticulous and so rigorous. This is who they were. And God's like, oh, man, you guys missed it. Because what I wanted for you is to see my law and come to the place where you cry out to me and go, we can't keep it. We are stuck on stupid. Like, God, what, what on earth? I can't do this. And God says, exactly, you need my son. My son who keeps the law perfectly and who demonstrates his own love for you in this, that while, while you are a blow it, you are a sinner, you can't keep it. Christ died for you, paid the penalty for your sin. But these religious leaders, they don't get that memo, right? The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 14, it actually says it twice in Proverbs. Proverbs uh, 14 chapter 12 or verse 12 is the, the first place, but it, it says there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And for these guys, they think the right way is through keeping the law through religion, that system of earning a right standing by works. And so Jesus answers them now in verse 14. And he said to them, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true, for I know where I come from and where I'm going, but you do not where, you do not know where I come from and where I'm going. You guys don't have a clue. You can't buy a vow. You can't phone a friend. You guys don't know, right? Jesus is saying, you don't know God. He continues, you judge, verse 15, according to the flesh, I judge no one. Now, a day is coming when Jesus will judge, right? He's talking about his first coming. He did not come to judge mankind in his first coming. He came to give his life as a ransom for many so that many might believe upon him and escape sin and Satan and death and ultimate judgment. There is a day coming when everyone will be judged according to Jesus Christ, but he's talking right now to them. He's like, you judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. I'm going to give my flesh for the salvation of many. And yet, if I do judge, my judgment is true. For I'm not alone, but <clears throat> I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. In other words, what he's saying is, look, you're, you're shouting out your law right now, telling me that my testimony is not true because I'm judging myself. I'm telling you that that my father bears witness of me. The word of God bears witness to me, right? Remember what happened just prior to this. John the Baptist uh, had baptized Jesus in the Jordan and both God the Father and the Holy Spirit showed up for the occasion. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. It's like, well, that settles it right there. You ain't gonna get a better witness than that, right? So there is the witness of, of two or more. But, he, but now he says, not only does, law, does, your, does the law say that, it's also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And then they said to him, where is your Father? And Jesus answered, and he said, you know neither me nor my Father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. And these words Jesus spoke in the treasure as he taught in the temple and no one laid hands on him for his hour had not yet come. It never once occurs to these religious leaders that they're in darkness and they don't have the light. 
the religious leaders, they're like, hey, we represent God and we oppose you. And Jesus is like, I am God. You know, you, you know, and it's been said that religion that opposes God or, or, or that religion opposes God in the name of God. That's what religion does. The sad truth is you can know the Bible and you cannot know God. That you can be the most moral person on earth. You can attend church faithfully. You can quote scriptures, chapter and verse. You can serve. You can be the best mom in the world. You can be the best dad in the world. And it's possible that you could still not know God. We observed last week that there was three types of people reflected in the story that preceded this. When Jesus came up to the temple to preach and they dragged this woman in. We said that there are those who are guilty and have been caught red-handed. There are those who are guilty and they seem to be getting away with it. And we said that there are those who are guilty and they're self-righteous and they're focusing on everybody else. And in many ways, this last group is the most dangerous place that we can possibly be in. Where... When we open God's word, it applies to everybody else, but it doesn't apply to us. <clears throat> and the fact of the matter is, is that when I'm seated in God's seat and I'm playing God, it's a really dangerous place to be. And so Jesus continues now, verse 21. Jesus said to them again, I'm going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. Why? Because they re rejected their only way that they could not die in their sin. And that's to receive the one who Jesus sent. Right? So the Jews said, will he kill himself? Because he says, where I go, you cannot come. They don't understand. Uh, and he said to them, you are from beneath, I'm from above. You are of this world, I'm not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. And they said to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, just what I've been saying to you from the beginning, right? I'm God. I have many things to say and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true. And I speak to the world those things which I heard from him. And they did not understand that he spoke to them of the Father. And then Jesus said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and that I can do nothing of myself. But as my Father taught me, I speak these things. Of course, he's talking about his crucifixion. Right, And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. What Jesus says here is this. He says, look, I came to do my Father's will. I came to give my life as a ransom for many. And what he's saying is, look, we can either believe him and receive him, or we can reject him and die in our sins. You'll recall when John began this gospel, he said this. I'm going to put it on the screen for you. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. And we're wrapping it up here. He says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Here it is, verse 5. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. That word comprehend, it literally means to lay hold of so as to make one's own. To lay hold of so as to make one's own. And notice in verse 30 as we close, it says, as he spoke these words, many believed in him. Many believed in him. And maybe for some of you today, either gathered here in person or maybe online, this needs to be you today that you'll believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll give you that invitation as we close in prayer. If you're taking notes, I want to end with three questions that I'd like you to invite you to take a walk with this week. Question number one, <clears throat> ask yourself this, what areas of my life am I tempted to exercise my own sovereignty rather than yield to God? In what areas of, of, of your life, what areas of my life is it that, that, that I'm personally tempted to exercise my own sovereignty rather than yield to God. Second question, how's my walk? 
Am I making due use of opportunities to walk in the spirit or walk in the flesh? And our third and final question, by the way, we'll put these up after the service as well. Third and final question, ask yourself this. In what areas of my life am I tempted to be religious and to play God? Father, we come to you today thankful for your word. And Jesus, we're thankful that you are the light of the world. Lord, there's two groups, those who love the darkness and want to walk in the darkness and those that are going to receive you as Messiah and walk in the light as you are in the light. And I want to pray that you would help us to do that today. I want to pray, Lord, for those right now, whether in person in one of our venues or, or watching online. I pray, Lord, that you would minister to their hearts. You say in your word that no one comes to the Father except for that the Spirit draws them. And as we're in this attitude of prayer, if you sense that the Holy Spirit of God is drawing you, if you sense that the Father himself drawing you today to cause you to acknowledge that you are in darkness and that Jesus is the light, I'm gonna give you that invitation, that opportunity today that you might cry out to the Lord God and invite Jesus to cleanse you of your sin. And you can do so by praying something like this, Lord Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner and I'm turning to you now by faith. I'm repenting, not religion, not doing good and trying harder, but I'm seeking a relationship with you. And so I turn now from the sin that I, that I so willfully engage in and I turn to you and I cry out and I say, God, make me a new creation in Christ. The Bible says if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. Do you need Jesus to make you a new creation today? Cry out to him. Lord, be my savior. Be my Lord. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin in my place. I believe that you suffered, that you died, and that you were buried, but that you rose again on the third day, that you conquered Satan and sin and death, and that you promised that if anyone's in Christ, he is that new creation, that old things pass away, all of my guilt, all of my shame, all of those things that I've done that Satan now stands accusing me of. And I plead to you, God, I'm guilty of every, of every last one but I thank you that you didn't come to condemn me. You came to save me. And so I cry out in a confession saying, you're God, I'm a sinner, I am guilty, but I'm asking you to cleanse me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, then you can know for certain that God has forgiven you. He has cleansed you. And now what he's inviting you to is to walk in the light as he is in the light. We're going to partake of communion now, the bread representing Jesus' body broken for us, the cup representing his blood shed on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And we come to the communion table remembering what Jesus has done for us. As we close in this final song and partake of communion, I'm inviting you to remember Jesus and to worship him. After we're all done, our pastors and leaders are going to be up here to pray with you, pray for you if you need prayer for anything. If you're online, our pastors are available waiting to pray for you. You call that number and, and you'll talk to a live person who wants to pray with you, pray for you today. Let's respond to the Lord Jesus Christ. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows
Uh, I'll stand together and sing one final uh, Christmas song with each other. If you have kids in the children's ministry, you're free to go get them now. That would help them out a lot. But let's let's sing out together to our Lord. Oh, come all ye faith. 
triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the King of angels. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore so thankful that we can come here again this morning just to worship you, to learn about you, to become more like you. We pray that as we go out these doors, Lord, Lord, we would put feet to our faith and um, we would practice, uh, Lord, what we preach. We lift us up in your name, Jesus, and all God's people said, amen. Hey, if you need prayer, um, we've got pastors up here. If you're online, you need prayer, click the little button down here. And uh, we'd love to pray for you guys. Don't miss out on this very important part of the service. And otherwise, we will see you guys next week.